Hail Orb YouTube, hail Orb everyone, and uh, welcome to the first ever edition of Doctor Who Fridays. And what has happened uh, this week is that uh, me and Koki Pirate have just, uh, literally just finished watching the first ever Doctor Who serial uh, broadcast in November 19, or well, commencing November 1963. Um, Koki um, has, had not ever seen classic Doctor Who before um, until, until uh, today. And um, I still haven't quite heard what he thinks. I saved it for the podcast. Um, James, who had some familiarity with classic Doctor Who, um, only recently um, got into the uh, classic series and is now re-watching them. So he has seen this serial um, uh, twice uh, fairly recently. Um, and I guess, um, well, a lot of the audience are going to know about the, the first serial um, which I suppose, how do I describe it? It introduces Doctor Who um, uh, and new companions, Ian and Barbara, um, and we have what we've dubbed, or what James and I have dubbed, prehistoric Shakespeare, or Shakespeare with cavemen, on a, a desperate quest um, for fire. And obviously, old Doctor Who, um, a very different animal from uh, what it is today. Koki, uh, you have just popped your classic Doctor Who cherry, and from over 50 years ago, seen um, the first ever Doctor Who adventure. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I like the premise, and uh, this is something we talked about before. I uh, really like that there were no aliens or anything, just cavemen, you know, because time-traveling adventure, time-traveling mm -hmm. is amazing enough. Um, the... Acting is a bit unintentionally moldy, I, I will say. Um, the granddaughter just sort of seems to be... I don't know, maybe these mannerisms were normal in the 60s, but it just seems as though, you know, the way she expressed herself was a bit over the top. And um, <laughs> the shaking TARDIS bit, where the <laughs> camera's shaking, and they're just sort of like, whoa, 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 I don't know. <laughs> it, it was just hilarious to me. Um... That being said, I did enjoy it. I, I like this story a lot. Um, I like the asshole doctor, you know, how he's like, <laughs> going to pull out a knife and kill someone so no one else uh, would uh, follow them. And even before yeah. then, he's like, yeah, we're not going to let them escape the TARDIS and return to their own time. This, mm. this is a very different doctor from the doctor that I'm familiar with, you know. So, yeah. Oh, de definitely. The, the, he was devised to be a... Uh very much an anti-hero. Um, the first Doctor does does soften. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's quite shocking that there was ever a time when the Doctor would so cynically... I suppose he doesn't consider it murder, because at the time he doesn't really see cavemen as people, I guess. Um, but um, and I guess he, he's, he sees it as, as they're caught up, like any, any character in that, as in a, in a fight and a, 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 and a struggle for survival. Um, as for the, the acting, I suppose there's two things. One, that Britain didn't have very many screen actors. Hartnell did have screen experience because he'd done movies like Brighton Rock. Um, he'd done a, a TV show before then. He had screen experience. He understood the camera. Um, most of those actors, or one of the things that seems so thespian and Shakespearean about it is, most of these actors are in, doing it in between repertory plays, it was the acting that was available. The other thing to remember is <clears throat> that this isn't an edited show. It wasn't broadcast live. But what they've essentially got is a limited studio. It was either three cameras or four cameras. Um, and e each one had three lenses because there was no zoom. And if you listen very carefully, you could actually hear a tap sometimes. Because a cap cut from camera A to camera B and the, the lenses have to turn on camera A as camera A gets into whatever position it has to be in for the next one. And uh, these guys editing literally meant a razor blade and sellotape. <laughs> literally. Yeah. You, you are. So they were very limited. They had a rule of no more than four edits per episode. I think episode one has an edit where they go, Ian and Barbara go through the TARDIS doors, even though the sets were built to be adjacent. I think that's because Ian does actually walk around the police box. So it's almost like trying to do a magic trick live, but not quite. Um, so that's what, hence you get mistakes, of course, like Hartnell, um, who wasn't a well man, 
uh, he says, get back to the ship, child, which obviously doesn't make sense in the context he says it. So he's, I don't know, I, I don't have the original shoot, uh, shooting script for this one, uh, so I don't know what the line was meant to be. He fluffs a line later, so you get, you get a couple of um, Hartnell mistakes left in because literally it was just so hard to make. When you think what we can do on a PC or a laptop, these guys literally sellotaping the videotape together. Um, and um, uh, was there anything else that particularly um, stuck out for you or surprised you? Uh, yeah, uh, the whole reaction, yeah, back in the ship. Yeah, yeah, you brought that up. I had forgotten about that mistake, but yeah. Um, does the doctor even see people as people? Just the way he regarded the other humans. He's like, I'd say that you're like <laughs> yes, children, but that would be uh, an insult to the children of my civilization. Even though if I, uh, yeah, it's a very... If I, oh, go ahead. If I can chime in on that aspect, because yes, well, what Alex was saying about not seeing cavemen as people, I do interpret the doctor's character. Uh, even uh, the act... Uh, first of all, Alex, just want to point point out, you mentioned introducing the doctor, you mentioned introducing Ian and Barbara, you forgot Susan. Yes, the, the eponymous character, because she's it's the other child. child. Yes, yes but, I uh, apologise. I stumbled over that a bit, yes. But uh, the point is that um, uh, Ka- uh, Bill and Carol, Susan and uh, Susan and the Doctor on the set, basically came up with uh, the Doctor's uh, backstory uh, to um, so, so that so that they. You know, you, Oh, the, that wonderful line from Galaxy Quest. You have to figure out what he wants. What is his motivation? Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, but that is the basis of character acting, having to know who he is, why he does the things that he does. And um, the way I've always seen it, uh, William Hartnell's interpretation of the Doctor is that he understands time and space. He has mastery of the TARDIS. He is centuries old. So, Mm. obviously, to him, humans are just a curious lab specimen. Mm. By comparison, the way that he is constantly condescending, not only towards uh, Ian and Barbara, but also towards his own granddaughter. Why? Oh, she's only two centuries old. She can't be expected to understand this sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, um, that makes sense. Yeah. So, so that is the way that I've always seen it. Um, but, yeah, that, that's my interpretation. But was there anything else you wanted to say, Koki, before I give my opinion? Uh, on this, so on this I guess my last thought on it is, um, why is she going to the school <laughs> of a civilization that is so... This probably gets explained. Well, it, she kind of, it kind of it suggested that it was her idea. You know, yeah. the doctor doesn't even understand why she goes all apparently she was particularly drawn to the humans specifically our species of that particular time period which yes, uh, she, I think hmm? when, the, when the doctor says okay we're going to take off no doctor please I love no grandfather please I love the 1960s uh, yeah she says that the three months that she spent going to Coal Hill are the, are the three happiest months of her life yeah she, so um, she so she is drawn to hu- she is drawn to humans she is drawn to that time period. Okay, yeah, she likes yeah, the yeah. Music, definitely. But it's implied that they've tried out a few others because Susan describes the TARDIS as having been some kind of column, which makes me think of Rome or, or Greece, and uh, as having been a Sudan chair. Also, when she looks at the f- book of the French Revolution. She says, that's not right, as if she has a better knowledge of the French Revolution, implying that she might have witnessed it. Mm. Um, remember, which, that, remember this, again, Koki, you won't know this because it's in a later serial. Oh, yes, it's grandfather's favourite period of Earth history. Aha, uh-huh, yes. So there you go. So there's, um, uh, yes, interesting, because the, the character, as Koki said, is very different here at the beginning uh, uh, of course, you wouldn't get the impression of him having a favourite era of Earth history from watching the first episode. It's like he doesn't want to talk to people, um, despite you know having no problem. He's he's acquired a smoking habit, 
This this is a pipe smoking doctor. Unless unless Gallifreyans really do smoke pipes and they look just like our pipes, but no, I don't imagine he acquired it like he acquired the clothing, like he acquired. Um, but um, yeah, there's and, and and he has a notebook in which I'd forgotten all of this. Cause I haven't seen the whole serial for a while. I watched the first episode before the anniversary. Mm-hmm. I'd complete. Oh no, I watched some of it with you, didn't I, James? A few yeah. months ago. But um, a notebook cataloguing their previous adventures. Um, that seems very undoctorish to me. Oh, uh, yes, again, another serial you won't have seen, Koki, because uh, you haven't gotten that far yet. But uh, the censorites still write with fountain pens and ink. An, a- <laughs> an alien species still mm-hmm. use fountain pens. No, you've just <laughs> got to remember that this is the 1960s. Computers yeah. for them were just hyper-advanced adding machines. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So um, things like reading, things like reading and writing with paper, having a notebook, and of course he's an old man. He's a he's a refined old man wearing a kind of Edwardian coat. Of course he's going to smoke a pipe. <laughs> uh, uh, they had they had to have some excuse for him to light a match. Well, yeah, I was going to say uh, when. I saw this with Alex. Alex mentioned that this is the only episode he remembers him smoking in. And it's like, mm. it was just a specific plot device that he smoked to, like, the worst possible place that he could have taken the smoke in. Um, you <laughs> yes. know, people are desperate for fire. And then he never smokes again. Well, I think maybe he he now associates lighting a pipe with being attacked by a caveman. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which I, that is I, the I, ultimate anti-smoking campaign right there. Yeah. <laughs> this, this needs to be... Why is it you never see a health warning on cigarettes or tobacco that warns you, well, you know, smoking may cause caveman attacks? <laughs> yes, the, the NHS should hire cavemen to walk around randomly attacking smokers, scream, uh, screaming, Fire! Give me the secret of fire! <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, and uh, oh, so many things, though. Another question that you asked, Koki, was, of course, because uh, they, 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 they do address the chameleon circuit, but they, um, but they don't uh, call it a chameleon circuit. They also don't address the, the translation circuit. I don't know when the translation circuit, translation matrix, whatever, is first um, mentioned. But here, the 1963 audience are just accepting that these cavemen talk like classically trained British actors. Okay. <laughs> God's <laughs> language, of course. Uh, well, it's Dalek speaking English, Cybermen speaking English. Yeah, creatures, uh, unnamed creatures from the planet Zog speaking English. Yeah, it's funny that, isn't it? Um, and um, I, I think the the comedian circuit thing. Yeah, the the idea that yeah, uh, it's supposed to disguise itself and, yeah, and jam. I, I think they yeah. actually describe it as um, a comedian circuit in the first serial. We see the meddling monk. Another thing for you to look forward to, Koki. But uh, uh-huh. that, that's the first time as they describe it as a chameleon circuit, because that's the first time uh, they talk really talk about the mechanics of the TARDIS. But mm-hmm. um, you know, but yes. Oh, sometimes. It, it's it could be a col it could be a a, a stone column or it or it could be a, a 17th century French carriage. Yeah, yeah. and uh, it's one of those things. It's like the, the girl, it becomes a running gag, I guess, that the Doctor will every few years say, "Oh, I've always meant, meant, meant to get around to fixing that damn chameleon oh, circuit." Oh, um, again, this is much much later in the Colin Baker yeah. era, towards the very end of classic Doctor Who. They do actually make fix it so that um, one Colin Baker episode it appears, and I can't remember. What, it looked it was a pipe organ or something. It was it, appears, it, it yeah. wasn't a police box, but uh, no, it has to be a police box. Otherwise, it's not Doctor Who. You know, if they did, if he did ever get the chameleon circuit fixed, it would be sabotaged within three seconds. Ah, so uh, James, um, 
I know that you are um, a very big fan of this serial, uh, Shakespearean Cavemen, um, in particular, um, and uh, whatever we call it, because sometimes it's called the Tribe of Gum, sometimes it's called 100,000 BC, um, and uh, I remember the first time you saw it, you were very impressed by it. So your, your full appraisal. So, uh, yes, first of all, I love the way that they basically introduce the whole concept of the Doctor through Susan. The way mm. in the very beginning, Ian and Barbara are talking about this strange girl who is mm. uh, just in some ways so advanced and in other ways uh, so backward. <laughs> the wonderful line. Oh, sorry. I, it, it's a. I'm sorry. I didn't realise that America. <laughs> I didn't realise that Britain had. Uh, I didn't realise that Britain didn't have the decimal system yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's yes. America that has the decimal system. Oh wait, that, <laughs> I'm still a few years behind. That was prophetic. Yeah, exactly. It was a, a genuine, um, a genuine prediction that came true for Doctor Who. Uh, I think I can remember when I was growing up, because I was born not like, well, in 1981, and decimalisation came in the 70s, so you would occasionally find a shilling. Yeah. And I was fascinated by this. But the fact that uh, Britain actually had dual currency for a while, for people to adapt to decimal. Um, oh, yeah. I do actually remember my dad... Um, tw- Florins, two shillings, were still around being used as ten pence pieces. So I do remember my dad um, and I going into a shop to buy a chocolate bar, uh, uh, him saying 20 pence, please. So he takes out two florin coins, two florin coins, 20 pence. What? Mm -hmm. Four shillings? You are are (laughs) kidding me. Ah... Yeah, but so, uh, yeah, uh, but uh, it's... but still, getting back to the uh, serial, uh, yes, uh, the, she, she's so advanced, and she, you know, why do we have to do this primitive science? Why can't we get on with something? Yes, she loves being in the nineteen sixties, but mm. of course, she is so advanced. She is an alien, perhaps a couple of centuries old, but. Um, Either way, though, Ian and Barbara are so uh, curious about her, so concerned about her. Yeah, mm. I, the address that she gave is a junkyard. <laughs> yeah. So um, driving to see her, and yes, they assume that this old man has kidnapped her and locked her in the cupboard. Uh, mm. Of course, it's the TARDIS. Uh, and... <sighs> Yes, and uh, and now that these primitive humans have seen the TARDIS, <laughs> they, as mm. as you as we've mentioned before, the Doctor won't let them out because no, he has no intention of uh, either himself or his daughter becoming a laboratory specimen for these primitive uh, hairless apes. <laughs> so um, yes, no, they take off. Um, one thing I remember from the documentary showing uh, the history of uh, the William Hartnell era of Doctor Who uh, mm. from the from the very beginning. Uh, to clarify, this is the docudrama an Adventure in Space and Time. Yes, thank you, Alex. I was I was hoping you'd chime in there. <laughs> um, the the I. <laughs> The way the, the the fact that uh, everyone was so pissed off that they uh, did the uh, caveman story as it was known first, it was the only story that was ready to go. Mm. They 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 wanted to start off with something else, something that would really interest people. But no, um, regardless of whether it was the first story or the first serial or the fifteenth, I am so happy that they didn't cut this, that they didn't say it was too boring. And uh, we, mm. we've talked about... Uh, sorry, um, Alex and Koki, you've talked about um, the fundamental difference between stage acting and screen acting. Mm. For me, what gives it life and depth and soul is the fact that it is um, television-based on theatre, 
Whereas mm. so much modern television, particularly New Doctor Who, made after 2005, is basically just uh, 30 minutes of a Hollywood film, desperately struggling to emulate a Hollywood film. Mm. The way that these actors, uh, they, the day before they'd been starring in Hamlet or Macbeth on stage, mm. You know, they had a couple of hours to learn this script, to mm. figure out the characterizations, to figure out the motivations, and then basically, as you say, perform the play in one take. Yeah, or, mm. or four, four take, uh, sorry, three takes because it is broken up over three episodes. But yeah. still, uh, it, for them, it was just another day on the job. Okay, um, I'm a caveman. Okay, I'm a caveman in the ancient world. What is my motivation? How am I going to play this? Obviously, you don't have time to learn a whole new character. So, um, in the case of the female caveman, uh, cave woman, especially female caveman, uh, the cave woman, especially, okay. Lady Macbeth, and it works <laughs> so bloody well. The opening scene, Tsar rubbing his hands, rubbing a bone between his hands, struggling to make fire, not understanding that you put the bone on the dead wood in order to cause friction. Mm. He th he honestly believes that magic is granted by Orp, the sun, that mm -hmm. this is a prayer ritual, you know, and mm. it it is just that one uh, and the the whole point of the serial, the whole basis, the whole premise of it, it, it is that it is the power struggle between mm. Zar, son of the fire maker. Uh, who never t his father never taught him how to make fire, uh, mm. and uh, Carl, the stranger who is the strongest hunter, uh, and it is just the one. It is just the, the wonderful line. The old men speak again. The, the, the Lady Macbeth character, Zar's girlfriend, and. Uh, Zar, as he is desperately trying to make fire, the old men speak against you. They say that you sit rubbing their hand. You, they say that you sit rubbing your hands whilst Carl brings us meat. Mm. Without meat, we go hungry. Without fire, we die. The old men see no further than tomorrow's meat. They will make Carl leader, and then my father will give me to him. It is just so beautiful, demonstrating that no matter how far we advance technologically, well, sorry, based on the premise that no matter how far we have advanced technologically, no matter how far we think that we have come, the power struggles of human beings are always exactly the same. In this serial, it's uh, the power of fire, the political power that comes with being the fire maker. In, a, in another future serial, um, of course, you won't have seen Koki. Uh, the Aztecs, it's all about water. It's all about rain. Pleasing the gods so that the rains will come. <laughs> or at least being the one who is seen to please the gods and bring the rain. Thus, the people will still work, still follow you. <laughs> uh, I, yeah. So, go ahead, Alex. I, I like a lot of them. I've been watching it again for the first time in a while. Uh, a lot of the sort of things that you take for granted that a human being would understand, or a Homo sapiens would understand. Where there's there's the business about understanding kindness and compassion, uh, as you say, understanding the actual science of you know th it's not just a magic ritual. It's almost religion versus science. Yeah, He's I, observing a ritual. I and do the, almost uh, want to scream at the computer screen. Put the bones. To the sticks, you fucking moron! But no, <laughs> again, go, 
go back in time a thousand years and explain the most basic, obvious scientific truths which are known by five-year-old children to the yeah. people of the day and you'd be burned as a witch. <laughs> exactly. And there's so much stuff like uh, uh, the woman initially not understanding... Um, is it is it Cal? Cal is not stronger than the whole tribe. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it has to be explained to her. Cal, Cal is not stronger than the whole. We're almost like you're seeing humanity walk for the first time, seeing a toddler walk for the first time, seeing humanity learn these basic. And, and, and then um, again, it's a it's a fictional representation. Obviously, yeah. there is no way to know that uh, Kate. Paleolithic societies actually behaved this way, but it is kind of a wonderful interpretation. Yes. When he, uh, and, and <laughs> sorry. I also wanted to point out, you see um, what might be the first ever practicing of forensics. You know, oh, who's yes. got the bloody knife? Who, who, you know, look for the person whose knife has blood on it. So simple. Yeah. Oh, and, and again, ex- again, uh, the doctor, in spite of the fact that he's uh, uh, hundreds of years old and uh, regards uh, humans, especially primitive humans, with contempt, uh, the way that he uh, uh, picks, essentially picks up the, their language, the way that they phrases things. The, the, the way that they phrase things in order to communicate with them in their own terms. This is a yeah. good knife. It has show. It shows what it has done. Ah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the use of language is, is brilliant. And you know what? Growing up, because I got this on VHS at the age of like 10 or something, um, like really like, oh my God, the first ever Doctor Who... Um, and I uh, always believe that cavemen were sun worshippers, and I don't actually know if there is. It makes sense in this story, because the sun is a heat source. They know they need it to survive. They'll assume that lightning striking a tree and setting fire to it is is orb sending fire, although they'd also know to fear it sometimes. They'd also know it can be a bad, dangerous thing, I guess. Oh, yes, but that's part the of character it, yeah. of the old woman, another part of the... Shakespearean um, Mm -hmm. uh, paradigm. Uh, The old woman who fears fire. (laughs) Oh, again, my father taught me how to sharpen the stone and to skin the lion and the bear. (laughs) Why did he not teach me this also? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so your my father could make fire, and they killed him for it. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, she is one of the people who fears fire. Imagine uh, f- whether it's fire or the hydrogen bomb, the politics are still the same. I, I like how um, soon after fire was invented, the torch-carrying mob came about. I, I just feel as though that's nice. <laughs> Logical progression. Of the <laughs> oh, and that wonderful uh, that wonderful line with uh, that that one of the uh, cave people points out that no, we can't find them with the dark. With fire, it is day. The, the use of <laughs> language um, <laughs> uh, to become, as you say, the torch carrying mob, but. Um, uh, Yes, there. You were talking before, assuming yes that uh, uh, Paleolithic people would worship the sun. Assuming this, assuming that, yes, it is entirely um, our assumptions of what um, a, a Paleolithic culture would be like. But that's the thing with art; it's artistic license. <laughs> <laughs> there is some, there is some tokenization of cavemen here. I mean, nothing we gather from hunter-gatherer people, at least that we can observe, would suggest that it would be such a weird thing to approach someone without killing them. But yeah, yeah okay, obviously, this, this idea that kindness and uh, compassion was so completely alien to them—that was the whole basis of tribal society. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Ah. So. Yeah, it's 
it has that sort of we need to civilize them kind of mentality. But you know, that that I can shelf on different era, different values, but yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Look, it, it, again, it's it's nineteen six. It's nineteen sixty three. We can um, forgive the editing. We can forgive the uh, mistakes. It is a basically a live play, but um, yes. Uh, that, but just to point out the fundamental reason why this is more more built upon assumptions and uh, w- white. Uh, 20th century privilege mm-hmm. is basically that there is no his- there was no history and there remains no history to build it on. Whereas uh, Koki, you will be in for a real treat with the other historical episodes. Oh yeah, because to the best of my knowledge, when there is genuine history, when there is. Um, something on which to base a true representation of different peoples and di- different cultures, then 1963, 1960s or not, this series shines through. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, not, I think... it's not simply uh, the white... It's Well, obviously, it's always going to be the white man's interpretation but mm. because, simply because the writers were overwhelmingly white men, but um, there is there is still uh, it was still so progressive. Def- definitely, even, I think even for this day and age, I, I compare some modern TV series to a, a original classic Doctor Who before they kill off the concept of. Um, historical yeah. serials uh, and, uh, I definitely I think the Crusades is very uh, very even handed um, and when you consider that um, I think that the m- more recent like post 9-11 um, edits of the movie of the, of the Disney movie Aladdin I think have the line praise Allah which is used in a completely innocuous way um, have that line removed you know so yeah the, the uh, how balanced and fair the Crusades is I would say that the Romans, which I do like, is to- it- that was based upon the history, the the Christian centric history, which yeah, still yeah. taught in the nineteen sixties. So as a result, it is grotesquely flawed. It was Christians who uh, burned Rome. You know, Nero wasn't even in Rome at the time. This whole idea that he wanted to burn Rome ground to the ground to uh, build a new Rome was um, propaganda against him, so on and so forth. So, yes, the, the Romans is by far the worst portrayal of actual history. But uh, still, in terms of in terms of um, averages, that's <laughs> as as a oh for God's sake, the new Pompeii movie. Uh, oh, it's not that, that's not Pompeii. <laughs> <laughs> that, that that just the trailer of that looks tasteless to me. I know that they've done like disaster movies based on real life events before, like the Titanic and things like that. But somehow they're, they're doing Pompeii like it's the, and it's in 3D, like it's the next big visual effect extravaganza, yada yada. Forgetting, uh, I can't remember exactly how many people were killed by Mount Vesuvius, but uh, a lot of people, because most of them choked to death, of course. You know, all these people who choked to death and had no idea what a volcano even was, didn't even have a word for it. You know, these poor people, and it's being sold as this big, fantastical... Look well, at my the, biggest your... problem is the complete lack of historical accuracy, because no, Pompeii was not the jewel of the Roman Empire, it was not the place where the decadent no, Roman elite laughed and twirled their moustaches whilst um, the slaves were worked to death or battled lions in the Colosseum. It was just a small fishing town. It had it was well, it. There was nothing of any real significance or historical note there, except there's for the a, fact that they just happened. So, no, I was going to say there's also a very high concentration of brothels, according to certain archaeological accounts. 
<laughs> no, yeah. that's not where Beca- it is. Well, because, ah. because if, if it's a port and people and sailors are stopping there, the, uh, what is Latin? What was Latin for uh, fancy a date sailor? <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> um, uh, how how on earth did it, this is the first time a Doctor Who podcast has ever gone into the subject of ancient Roman prostitution? <laughs> but it um, won't be the last time. <laughs> I, so I do like it in because new new Doctor Who has an episode is set in Pompeii. And there's a line by Calcilius, the Peter Capaldi character, um, where he's, he's, he's a father. He's got um, a, a son and a daughter. And there's a bit where he's talking to his wife and he lists the undesirable or strange types he doesn't want his, um, his children hanging around with. And the last uh, 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 thing on that list is Christians. <laughs> Who I suppose were, were still a weird sect. Oh yes, sect uh, at that were time. a weird sect. Were followed only by women and slaves. Yes, of course he wouldn't yeah. actually have said Christians because that was a that was a that, that took a couple of centuries to come in. Come to that, that's an inaccurate. There's, there's a similar inaccuracy in in the Romans. Yeah, because he had a cross. They didn't wear one. the cross. It would have been, it would have been a fish if anything at all. It could even have been a pentagram. Mm. In fact, I know somebody who was told off by her minister um, for having a pentagram tattoo from her, before, she, uh, before her conversion to Christianity. And she did some research on the internet and said, um, the pentagram was an early symbol for Christianity. Yep. Oh, um, how things change. Indeed, but, indeed. Uh, yes. Uh, but, yes. Um, the, as for the, the issue of race, I'm going to throw this in because Koki pointed out a few things. Uh, one thing was, uh, they've got tiger skins and they've got bear skins. So this is going back to an earthly child, a tribe of gum. Um, if they have tiger skins and bear skins, they're presumably in uh, Central Asia. Or northern um, India, yeah. Uh, that that uh, would yeah. be close to the Porcus Mountains, though, where Porcasians orig- originated. Oh, okay. Oh, that makes sense. Okay. Wow, learn something new every day. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and of course, the, the origin of BBC English. <laughs> it is interesting how the audience at the time, they, you know, I don't know when the translation matrix was first explained, but it is interesting the audience at the time were just accepting, as you say, cavemen, Daleks and Stahls, um, you know... Um, all just happened to speak English. It wasn't new Doctor Who needed to uh, explain it in the second episode. So as soon as the TARDIS takes Rose somewhere, the Doctor explains. Well, the TARDIS gets inside your head and it translates things. Um, in an audio which I heard recently, they did something quite interesting, which is the Doctor meets. It's it's uh, it's in World War One, and the Doctor meets. Um, an English woman who isn't a companion. She's never been inside the TARDIS. And he, when he talks to two German officers, we, of course, hear it in English. They tell him, uh, your, your German comes from a textbook, sir, which is interesting, suggesting that the translation circuit always goes with a very standardised, a bit like how GCSE French isn't how the French generally speak, and, you know, it's too textbook to be authentic, you know. Um... And when the doctor turns from the Germans back to the English girl, she's suspicious of him because he speaks German. So, literally, but he's speaking English when it's directed at her. So the translator have actually decided at some point that the translation matrix pays attention to who you're talking to. Because as far as... Um, I suppose the, as far as the doctor's concerned, it's always Gallifreyan. The Germans hear German when he's talking to them, and so does she. But she hears the German without understanding it. Now, it's, it's almost, a, it's mo- almost that, that sounds like a classic Moffatism, although it's it's not Moffat. It's no. not Moffat, but it does it's, sound like just one one of those uh, constant. Um, mistakes or errors or additions, like uh, the Doctor smoking a pipe and never smoking it again. Uh, For some reason, they wanted the girl to be suspicious of him because he speaks German, so they made up some shit about um, uh, 
the TARDIS and the way they all oh uh, uh, the the TARDIS or the the sonic screwdriver yes they are the ultimate get out of plot hole free card. <laughs> Uh, but but anyway, I I find it interesting. Although trying to explain it just then, it sounded like a lower low. Oh, uh, yeah. Koki, forget that reference. <laughs> yeah, oh God, a lower low, Koki. You should see it at some point. But it it has to be. I won't explain it now because it's not on the lower low pod, co- podcast. But that has to be seen to be believed. Um, I was actually quite surprised because there is M- is it M M&M and M number one fan. Yeah. Um, on, on YouTube is actually in a Lower Low fan did a series of videos I didn't know anyone outside the UK watched a Lower Low <laughs> and uh, okay it's been a while actually so, so back to you Koki do you have any uh, any more thoughts uh, no we've covered a lot of bases uh, I enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to seeing more um, okay, and um, James, any final thoughts? Yes, uh, when I was quoting Czar before, I accidentally said the lion and the bear, but no, it's uh, the tiger and the bear because uh, they are somewhere in northern India, Central Asia. But uh, no, it's to this day, it is one of the greatest um, Doctor, Do- Doctor Who serials as far as I'm concerned. Uh, precisely because of its theatrical nature. Mm. If only we could go back to uh, theatre, uh, t- theatrically based television instead of <laughs> constantly trying to uh, emulate Hollywood films. Uh, I'll put that on my wish list uh, just above a flying cat that dispenses magical marshmallows which turn you into pixies. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, my final thoughts on this episode are, knowing how small the studio was, knowing the limitations of the budget, Absolutely. knowing that we're in a bit of a hurry, um, it feels so real. It's, I, I am very theatrical acting or, or no theatrical acting and, and low budget or no low budget. You would never think it was in such a small studio. You would never, you, you know, everything about it, you believe it. I, I, I almost could be belie- believed that I'd seen like a saber tooth tiger, which of course you don't. You know, you, you are in that world. Yes, and that's part um, of YouTube. That is part of my ultimate complaint. Give artists restrictions and by, by some paradox of glory that <laughs> inspires them to grow, to find new solutions, to find way, some way around it. Give Moffat a milli, multi-million dollar budget and he turns it, it turns Doctor Who into a jumped up firework display of a toy advert. Ah, uh, and we're back to the Moffat hate. <laughs> As if the Doctor Who community isn't... So- Ah, oh, but anyway. Well, it's not just Moffat, it's Davis as well. It's all modern television, which is desperately trying to emulate uh, a Hollywood movie. Okay, well, I would like to uh, thank my guests, Koki Pirate and, uh, and you, James. And I'll just say um, that I'm really looking forward uh, to next week's which, of course, is the first ever appearance of the Daleks. And all we've seen so far is a, a little bit of a, a mysterious planet and the radiation needle, or the, the Geiger counter needle, going gradually up. Oh, yeah, as... uh, sorry. That was just such a wonderful cliffhanger. <laughs> you, can make, you can create that much tension. Imagine being just an just an ordinary viewer in the in 1963 yes uh, yes the radiation looks normal walks away <laughs> and then the needle goes up to danger because remember this was the 1960s when the threat of nuclear war when the threat of radiation poisoning was real it did hang in the air no pun intended <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Um, and so, um, next week, the Daleks. Little, 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 little.